Good morning. My name is Horton Frank, and it is my pleasure this morning to have a conversation with my father, Richard Horton Frank, Jr., as part of the Oral Legal History Project for the Nashville Bar Association and the Tennessee Bar Foundation. Dad, will you please tell us your full name? Uh, as you said, my <laughs> full name is Richard Horton Frank, Jr. And when and where were you born? I was born at Queen Daughters Hospital in Columbia, Murray County, Tennessee. The attending physician was Dr. George Williamson, who, bless his heart, one delivered practically every baby in Murray County over a period of years. And, and secondly, came to my law school graduation. Tell us about your parents and grandparents. My parents were obviously Richard Horton Frank, and my mother was Jean Noble Frank. My uh, father's uh, parents were John P. Frank, John Philip Frank, and Jesse Frank. And my mother's parents were Albert H. Noble and uh, Victoria Albert Noble. Tell us about the first memories you had as a child growing up. Briefly, the first memories I had dealt back into the beginnings of the Depression. We had sold a large portion of the farm my father had and uh, lived in a small house with uh, originally no electricity. Telephones were unheard of. And um, it, it was a bit of a hard life, but we didn't realize it was. And where was this? This was uh, in Brentwood, just uh, to the east of Brentwood, uh, the old Perkins place, as they say. Subsequently, Dad uh, was transferred to West Tennessee primarily to Savannah, Tennessee for about six months, and then to Camden, where we, were, we resided for over six years, at which time uh, I began what formal education I got, which originally was Miss Doris Hutchison's kindergarten to which I graduated to Miss Doris Hutchison's first grade. And she was really one of the three or four teachers in my lifetime who had the greatest um, impact on me. We stayed in touch with her after we came back up here until finally she died of old age. But she was a lovely woman and influenced generation after generation of students because Benton County had only one grammar school. It served the entire county. It had no running water. The uh, facilities were two eight-holers back on the side of the hill. and. Uh, the water system originally was a tin bucket with a dipper. Now, things got a bit more modern before I left uh, after the sixth grade. But uh, that illustrates the depth of poverty that that area had during the Depression. This was from 32 to uh, to 40. Nin <clears throat> 1932 to 40. I, uh, eight, eight, <laughs> 18. I feel that way sometimes. But uh, 
during that time, I would not have exchanged my experience in Camden for anything because it was just coming into the 20th century and large parts of it had not gotten there yet. On Saturday, all the farmers drove their mules and wagons with their produce in and parked around the, uh, the square. On each corner of the square was a Pentecostal preacher preaching uh, hellfire and damnation to all who would listen. And uh, it, 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 was, it was pure country. We would, <clears throat> my friends and I would get on our bicycles and either hold our guns across the handlebars or um, our fishing gear and pedal half a mile out into the country. And we would literally be out in the wilderness at that time. So um, I'm glad I left when I did, but I wouldn't have exchanged that experience for anything. Where'd the family move when you left Camden? Uh, we moved back up to, to Brentwood where uh, we stayed, um, well, the family stayed forever. forever. Uh, we moved a little bit off a mile or two, but that, after I got married. But uh, the family had always been in uh, in Brentwood. My uh, grandfather, grandfather Noble was a pharmacist, as was his father, as was his father. But uh, my grandfather moved out to Brentwood and built a, uh, a pharmacy building out there on what is now the corner of uh, Old Hickory Boulevard and Franklin Pike, and which has become known as Noble's Corner. But uh, The, as, as I say, the family was was long there. Dad's family did not live in Brentwood. His father died early, actually before we came back. His mother was a blind, bed-bound invalid. So uh, he lived with us, obviously, in, uh, in Brentwood, but uh, his his mother lived in Nashville in an apartment where she could be looked after. And um, until they they died out, why uh, the family stayed there. My uncle J uh, Glenn was heard to say when we moved down here, four miles north of Brentwood that I never thought Dick would leave Brentwood. Where'd you go to school during that period? <clears throat> well, as I said, I went to, through the sixth grade in Benton County. And then we moved back up here and I went for the next two, two years to Robertson Academy to which my mother had gone and to which uh, my son and daughter subsequently went. So we had three, three generations in Robertson Academy, which was one of the two oldest schools in Davidson County. And from there, I didn't particularly distinguish myself, but I didn't disgrace myself either. I think they, uh, I had seven, there were seven of us in a graduating class. And I ranked number two and you had to give a, give a speech at graduation. But um, from there, I enrolled at Hillsboro, uh, a school in which I was not supposed to, uh, to enroll but we did not have the intervention of a federal court at that time. And um, I was picked up 
by the Central High school bus near my home, brought down onto Franklin Pike and let out. There were about five of us did this finally. And walked across the street and got on the bus for Hillsboro and went over there. But um, they had, it was a public school, but there was as good an education available there as there was at any of the private schools at that time. Um, the teachers were dedicated, they were well informed, and um, learning was a, really a, a pleasure and uh, we managed to survive it. Actually, I, 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 the war was still going on, and uh, or the Korean War had started about that time. And I wanted to enlist, and my parents told me I could not until I graduated from high school. So I speeded up my courses and graduated in three and a half years and uh, ran out of war. About, about the time I graduated, I think the, uh, the North Koreans uh, heard I was coming and, and quit. Were there any events or people other than uh other than World War II and, 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 and the Korean War that, um, that influenced you during that period? Oh, not really during that period. My um, biggest focus was on, I guess you're like Marie Antoinette felt about it, getting it over with. But uh, subsequently, I started Vanderbilt in uh, March. What year? Of 46, 1946. And at that time, as I say, George, Kate, and I were the only two students in that class coming in at that time who uh, were not uh, coming in from the uh, from the military, but rather from uh, coming to, from high school, male that is. Did you and George Kate, both of y'all became lawyers, right? We became lawyers, and uh, during our high school years, he went to Lytton, I believe, and uh, but he and I were both on debate teams. And we ended up as the two finalists in the every, each one of the county debate contest. And uh, I, I got kind of, I like George, but I got kind of sick of seeing him under those, those circumstances. But, but we were fortunate in that uh, our class classmates were more mature, and uh, studied hard, played hard, uh, remembered what they were there for academically, and they knew what they were there for otherwise as well, but that's beside the point. <coughs> Um, it matured both George and I, I think, because uh, if we were not going to, if, if we go, were going to merge with our classmates, why we had to be more mature, because they were, they had gone through, in many cases, uh, let's say simply maturing uh, incidents. In World War II? 
in World War II and the, well, mostly in the Vietnam, Vietnam in the K Korean Korean. thing. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, oh, something was said to, oh, when uh, Chancellor Branscombe put up new uh, buildings for the students to replace the uh, army barracks, that wooden barracks they had. Why, he promised to uh, to talk again to the seniors, which promise he broke promptly the same day. But he he told him he said these are young eighteen year olds that have to be supervised and have some protection. And one of the boys spoke up and he said, when I was 18 years old, I was down on my butt in a rice paddy in uh, Korea. And a North Korean was trying to blow my head off and I was trying to kill him before he did. And nobody was looking after me which I hope John Barksdale remembered. <laughs> Not Barksdale, but uh, Branscombe. What, uh, uh, when you're getting out of graduating from Hillsborough High School, what led you to go to Vanderbilt? Well, two or three things. One, Vanderbilt was uh, a good school with good, uh, good faculty. It was in Nashville. Economically, I needed to live at home and commute. And plus the fact that at that time I had, uh, I was also had a uh, business of my own I was operating. I had uh, a deputy sheriff's uh, commission to uh, serve civil papers and I had a fairly active social life. Uh, most of them are respectable matrons now. What kind of business were you running? When I was 12 years old, I uh, read an article about a lady in Morristown, Tennessee. God, your memory comes back. Mrs. B.F. Piercy, I haven't thought of that in years. Uh, who raised Angora rabbits. And if you will remember the days when there were the Angora sweaters on the girls and they shed on every dark suit or tuxedo that you had. Well, that was Angora rabbit wool. And because of the wipeout of the industry in, Jap in Japan, why, uh, the uh, wool went up to, I think the top price was $38 an ounce. And you raise these rabbits, not for meat, but for, uh, for their wool, just like sheep. Shear them about four times a year. But, but um, I was fortunate with the, this one um, rabbit and through my agricultural ignorance, why I uh, did a breeding program to try to build up the uh, the production of, of the rabbits to the extent that I did not uh, breed a rabbit for my breeding herd that had less than 16 ounces a year of average wool. Now, the national average for these was under 12 ounces. So I kept a production record for each of these and could sell a rabbit <coughs> with three or four generations of production history behind it. As a result, in the 19, early 1940s, I was selling male rabbits, bucks, 
over North America for a hundred dollars a piece. Now, in 1942-43, a hundred dollars was a whole lot of money, and um, it helped put me put me through college and my personal uh, expenses and my evening peccadillos. But um, I was, I learned one very important message. I was writing a co monthly column for two different rabbit magazines, association magazines. And I was gazed, I answered questions that were mailed in and I was viewed as, you know, the gray-haired sage of the rabbit industry. I was elected director of the uh, Angora Wool Mill in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and it was just beside myself. So when the annual meeting came up, why? Well, a couple of us drove out to Colorado Springs. And when I walked into the meeting, it wasn't the gray-haired sage that walked in, it was this 15-year-old punk kid. It blew my whole image. And I learned from then on, that you stay out of the limelight, you get where you're going, and you let other people front for you. So if they get killed, you don't bleed. <laughs> what else do you remember about uh, about Vanderbilt and Nashville generally when you were an undergraduate at Vanderbilt? Uh, when I was an undergraduate at Vanderbilt, things were a blur because in order to get through and through law school and having joined the uh, Naval ROTC, why, uh, I didn't have much time. When did you enlist so, in the Naval uh, ROTC? Uh, I st when I first started uh, Vanderbilt, after the first semester, but a friend called me and asked me if I'd heard that they were signing him up. I said, no, and <coughs> he said, well, it closes, this is Friday, it closes Monday. We, we got it together and uh, got the papers in because it was uh, the first one they gave books, tuition, uniforms, $50 a month uh, subsistence. Uh, they pay a little better now. And you got a regular Navy commission, not reserved, but regular. So. Uh, We got in, but I had to take 20 hours a semester, 20 semester hours, which they said I couldn't do. They said, you can't take over 15. I said, you're not taking them, I'm taking them. And um, I did that and carried on my, my other businesses and activities. He, um, I learned a whole lot serving civil processes for the sheriff that is non-criminal work. Uh, I remember I was taking a young lady to a dance one night where I had a tailcoat and white tie on and uh, I was in the habit of stopping it if there was a, a recipient of a subpoena on my route, I'd stop and make expenses, you know, by serving it on him. And so uh, I rang the bell and opened the door, and the man looked at me and I explained why I was there. That was deputy sheriff. He says, you are the blank blankest deputy sheriff I ever saw. Come in and have a drink. <laughs> but you met all sorts of people. 
I had a um, undertaker of color out in South Nashville that would help me find difficult people. And I had uh, Sue Bridgeforth who owned the uh, that great Paradise Club here out on uh, Jefferson, which had a special segregated section to put the, the white patrons in, but who brought in some of the finest bands, big, jazz, big bands, jazz bands, Benny Goodman and so forth, over to, uh, to his club. And he had a bouncer weighed about 400 pounds named Bill Big Brown. And uh, when I wanted to get in touch with somebody in that end of town, I'd call Big, and within a few hours, well, the phone would ring, and someone would say, Mr. Frank, I understand you've been looking for me. Where can I meet you? So you, you learn to work with people. When did you graduate from Vanderbilt? Uh, undergraduate. Undergraduate, I'm not too sure. I don't know. I was the only junior in absentia that Vanderbilt ever had. Now, I graduated from law school in the, summer, in the spring of 1951. I had started law school having continuing to take uh, my Navy courses, which were, gave me academic credit, times such that when I got through law school, I would have also uh, got graduated, would also have acquired enough academic credits to get my degree. Actually, I did it a little faster than that because in 1950 I got my BA and in 51 I got my, what then was an LLB which is now JD. So uh, it was interesting. Quick. I had some, especially in law school, some wonderful teachers. Tell us about some of those folks. Well. John Wade, who is now retired as dean, but who uh, was a marine officer on Guadalcanal, worked many of them survived, and uh, wonderful man, wonderful teacher, probably the leading American authority on torts. Uh, Dutch Hartman who had been an intelligence officer, a captain, in the South Pacific on the commander's staff, who taught uh, contracts and partnership. And uh, he, he was wonderfully good. Uh, Those probably more than any anyone else influenced me and continued Dutch particularly to be my close friend until he died. Fritz Mayer also was a good good man. In fact, they were the ones that, together with a bottle of pinch bottle of scotch, made me uh, sign up to go as an unpaid adjunct teacher at Vanderbilt Law School to establish an intellectual property division. What was it, um, what was it that made you decide you wanted to go to law school in the first place? Um, a certain amount of analysis, I suppose. I got through undergraduate school, or was in the track to get through undergraduate school, 
it occurred to me that a law education would be uh, be useful in anything I got into, business, what have you. So I got uh, started there in the spring semester, and uh, so I was taking a uh, equity, which talked about uh, various remedies. And uh, at that point, I didn't know what remedies were because I was, I was going backwards. It's, um, I had a nasty habit of that. In uh, high school, I did the same thing. I took the second half of Spanish before I took the first half. So uh, I suppose I talked backwards in Sp Spanish. Um, uh, that too was interesting, but I got into the lo first year of law school, and I knew that was what I wanted to do. So I did. And uh, it, well, it has, has been and is um, very valuable to me in anything I do. It was valuable to me in the practice of law, in uh, dealing with clients, businesses that uh, weren't strictly law, but uh, gave the framework uh, in which to conduct their business. And uh, all, of, all of that is framed in law. Practicing law was a challenge in virtually anything you do. I mean, business, finance, uh, it isn't all Perry Mason. In fact, only a couple of times have I felt like Perry Mason. Then I did not have a secretary like he had. <laughs> but um, they were interesting er early on. W one of my senior partners had been United States attorney. And so he was getting a lot of whiskey cases because in those days there was a lot of whiskey cases. One of the principal industry in Tennessee was white whiskey. And um, it, it, w it was fun defending those sometimes. When you got through with law school at Vanderbilt, did you, is that when you uh, began your active duty in the, in the United States Navy? Almost. Okay. Uh, take, it, take us in that direction. Well, it was horrible direction. I, I suffered. I graduated from Vanderbilt Law School. Got my commission at that time. And uh, then started studying for the bar exam. The Navy gave me a few extra days of leave to take the bar exam. So I was trying to gather my affairs up, get my uniform together, uh, study for the bar exam, and uh, hope that somehow I could get through it. The bar exam took uh, two days. and. Uh, as I think I mentioned to you earlier, Judge Williams was the secretary of the bar examiners and had been since uh, Noah's animals came back off the ark and started deciding who'd be judge and who'd be the uh, attorney. Where did Judge Williams sit? Who, who right what? between George Kate and myself. No, on what court? Uh, well, he ended up, I think, on the Supreme Court. He was on court. He was 
a chancellor, then I think he was on Court of Appeals, and then on the Supreme Court, and a brilliant man. And the smartest thing he ever had was a very, very brilliant secretary who became the first woman lawyer at the, uh, day, at the uh, Nashville Bar and smarter than any of the men. Do you remember what her name was by chance? No, I don't. Okay. Tell us about taking the bar exam. But, but anyway, we took the bar exam with uh, Judge Williams talking to both of us all the time. And very difficult. And the night of the second day of the bar exam, by this time, as you can imagine, I was exhausted. I mean, just cross-eyed exhausted. And we went over to say goodbye to Dave Lanson, who was clerk of the Supreme Court, and with Dad's closest friend and sort of my godfather. And he pulled out a pint of scotch and he said, Dick, don't open this till you get on the train, but you'll need it then to go to sleep. He was right. Um, I got on the train at midnight in a coach. Couldn't, have, couldn't afford a Pullman. And uh, got off the next day in Norfolk and reported on board uh, my first ship, which was a escort carrier. They don't have them anymore. It had wooden decks and a 19 knots top speed. But there I was for a couple of years. And um, also at that time, I probably had more raw power than I've ever had before or since. I was personnel officer, legal officer, administrative officer, division officer for the Master at Arms Force, which was sort of like sheriff, and stood the underway deck watches. And anybody who wanted anything on that ship, including the captain, had to see me to get it. And um, I didn't know any better. I ran it like a small town, small county courthouse. And my friends, I rewarded. My people who didn't behave toward me, I punished. Do you remember the name of the ship? Palau, P-A-L-A-U. Um, as I say, did 19 knots top speed. And um, because an airplane had to have not only natural wind blowing, but you had to turn into the wind to create enough wind across the deck so the, thing, uh, the airplane would lift up in the air instead of falling in the water. Uh, we had some that did both. Uh, but it was chasing the wind around with this little uh, little carrier, it was on a tanker hull. Uh, that was an experience and you sweated because you knew you could very easily kill somebody. But uh, that too was a maturing experience. Then I came out of there and with a little finagling got transferred up to Great Lakes to a legal billet and uh, had been there just a little while. When I was over at uh, the officer's club, sitting at the bar and having a drink, when this young lady comes in, and being a Southern gentleman, I offered her my seat, and we chatted each other up a bit, and uh, I th as I recall, I think I dated her perhaps the first time that night, and then, then the next night. In the meantime, prior to that time, another officer and I had uh, <coughs> rented a little cottage on the back of the state. This was up north of Chicago. Is that where Great Lakes was? Yeah. and. Uh, in those days, 
two, two men could share an apartment without people thinking there was something strange about them. But Fred, very quickly, Fred was a product of Ivy. What do you mean? His <coughs> father was general counsel for the Union Pacific, based in Cheyenne, Wyoming. He went to Deerfield Academy, Dartmouth, and Harvard Law School. I mean, that is the guild age. Um, and was just country as it could be. But then Fred started dating Kitty also. Is this the same lady that you met at the lady. officer's club? And I would date her one night and double with uh, Fred and her. And I would date her one night and Fred I went off and did whatever he wanted to do. The next night, Fred would date her, and I would double date with him with this little captain's daughter that I was fooling around with. And then we would repeat. The two of us alternated her evenings that she wasn't on duty for oh, a couple of three months, at which point she and I got in, engaged. And we were so shocked that it happened so fast that we put off the wedding date for six months and then uh, got married, which is fortunate for you and for your sister. And um, we had, the first few years we were pretty poor. God bless her. But we had 40 years of a wonderful marriage before cancer finally mm -hmm. killed her. What was life like at, at were you still at Great Lakes when, we were uh, when you were engaged? We were at Great for a little while. And uh, we had wanted to, to have children as soon as we could. We had a very successful wedding trip, and you were born nine and a half months after our wedding. Now we need to take a break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did, uh, did, did, uh, did, further, did further academic study overlap there with your early years of your marriage? Uh, no, no academic study. I was teaching. When did you go to NYU? Oh, I beg your pardon, yes. <coughs> I had told my wife that I t her parents, in the meantime, had moved from New Jersey to Buffalo. He was an engineer. And I said, go up and visit with him because we're going down and practice law, and it's going to be hard, and I won't be able to afford to send you up there for a while. So she went on up to uh, Buffalo, and uh, I had a drinking companion who was the senior surgeon at Great Lakes Hospital. I was a junior, very junior officer. He was a very senior officer, but he had, his name was William Bean. He was a Vanderbilt graduate. He was the direct descendant of the William Bean, who was the first child, first white child born in Tennessee, and whose daddy bit his ear off because he didn't think it was his. But uh, anyway, Captain Bean and I got to be uh, real good friends. And I, I asked him, say, hey, could I get you to take my appendix out? And he says, has it been bothering you? I said, yes. And I lied at this point. I said, I don't want to get on a destroyer and have it taken out on a wardroom table. He said, come over Monday morning. I'll take care of you. So 
So I did. The nurse on duty, who was redhead who smoked cigars, would not believe that Captain Bean would operate on the junior officer until she woke me up about two o'clock in the morning and said ugly things to me. She said, the orders had just come in and Captain Bean's going to take out your appendix tomorrow morning. I said, I told you so. So she got her, her revenge. She got a dull razor dry and prepped me with it. It's terrible, but when you had surgery, after you, as soon as you were released from the hospital, you got 10 days uh, recuperative leave. So I got out of the hospital and hit the ground running and went to Buffalo, which was why I had my appendix taken out to begin with. I wanted to see your mother. And while I was up there, this leads around to answering your question, but you got to know the background a little bit. Uh, the office called. I had had a terrible experience in that before we got married, I was supposed to come back and practice law with three prominent young lawyers, all of whom I knew. And um, they seemed to like my academic background and my personality and what have you. Anyway, <coughs> after we were married and you were on the way, they broke up. One of them became city attorney, one went to Johnson City, and one became county attorney. And um, so when the phone rang and the office said, our tax man has just left us. We want you to go to NYU and study taxes. I thought that tax were things that you held carpets down with. But if they wanted me to go to New York and study taxes, well, I would do so. So we did. And uh, it was a good school then. There were only two people on the faculty, and they were both administrative. But it was a great compliment to be asked to teach at NYU Tax Division. We had a the assistant United States Attorney for Tax Affairs come up once a week from Washington and teach a course. In fact, he loved martinis, and he and I knock off a couple of martinis before course. Uh, we had the head of the uh, John Hancock um, Retirement Plans Division come down from Boston. Uh, Trackman, who wrote the book on um, on contracts, taught contracts there. And you got a wonderful education from people who were on the firing line and who not only knew the law, but have been applying it day by day better than anybody else in the business. Um, subsequently, the Law School Teachers Union, which is a terrible outfit, uh, required that in order to be accredited, a law school had to have, I think my figures are right, 80% of the faculty full time. So suddenly you got a bunch of little snivelly nosed uh, graduates who had made good grades by reciting back to the professor his, le his lectures verbatim and who didn't know a damn thing. And uh, it hasn't been as good a uh, 
cool as it used to be. What degree did you get at NYU? Uh, LLM, which is a Master of Law in Tax, LLM Tax, Master of Laws in Tax. Uh, it's sort of the equivalent of a second PhD, however, because my law degree actually had the status of a doctorate. So I guess you could call me Dr. Doctor, <laughs> like they do in Germany. Share with us so that so that we 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 have it, uh, Kitty's full name, and we know we know one child, but my sister, uh, so we can get your descendants down. Uh, Kitty's name, married maiden name, was Catherine with a K, Barbie Hand, B A R B E H E W N, which was a German family from uh, Alsace-Lorraine and had been uh, in uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania for several general number of generations. Her mother was a Price of originally from the Kentucky Prices. Uh, Then uh, that is sort of, we had two children, Horton first of all, as I've mentioned, and then his sister 23 months later, I mean we had our timing exactly as we wanted it, and I had mentioned to Kitty that I'd like to have a boy and a girl. And bless her heart, she did that. I said, okay, we, we've got what we've asked for. Let's don't take any chances. Enough. <laughs> but um, my, my daughter was Mary Delphia Frank, who married um, Stan Scobie and is married to Stan, Stan Scobie. Uh, the Mary is for Kitty's mother. The Delphia is for not only my mother, but uh, the family because she is, I think, the seventh Delphia in the line in the family. The first two name was Philadelphia, which in the, back at the, in that time was a fashionable thing to name the girl. I don't know whether they, they named any Terra Hutt or not, but <laughs> then after two Philadelphias, there was a series of Delphias. And Mary Dell didn't like Delphia, so uh, she is called Mary Dell, D-E-L, which causes a certain amount of trouble. So when you when you earned your master's in tax at, at NYU, tell us about your your return to Nashville and, and, and the beginning of your active practice of law. All right now the initial practice of law now would probably frighten most of the uh, young aspiring lawyers out of the county. But I had been relatively successful in law school at Vanderbilt. You know, sometimes uh, you just get hot on multiple choice. But um, I finished eighth uh, in a class of 127 and was the order of the coit. And then in, uh, at NYU, I also was sort of lucky. And uh, 
was editor of the Tax Law, student editor of the Tax Law Review. So I come back to Nashville. Uh, and as I was wont to say, the eagles of victory had perched upon my head. And no. the laurel wreath of victory had been placed upon my head, and the eagles of victory had crept upon my laurel leaves. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of the way it does because the deal I had, as I say, with fairly good credentials, was $100 a month guarantee against half of what I brought in. And I had a table in the library for an office. What law firm? That was, at that time, Barksdale, Hudgens, and Osborne. Osborne left our law firm before he had his unfortunate problems, which I prefer not to discuss. They didn't affect us, but um, in many ways he was a nice man who was badly mistreated by that great criminal uh, organization, the Federal Department of Justice. Um, anyway, things went on there. I made more in my 12th month than I did in the first 11. And then things picked up some I was uh, picking up clients of my own, and uh, a number of which I was assisted in getting by uh, accountants who uh, wanted an, had, a had a client who wanted an out-of-town lawyer to handle their fiscal affairs because in small towns, why, there ain't but one social bar. People, businessmen, bankers, and so forth, do not like to discuss their problems, which may be legal problems, with their drinking companions on Saturday night at the country club, when it's the only country club in town. Columbia, Murfreesboro, Rockwood, Harriman. I ran the East Tennessee circuit. So they like to get an out-of-town lawyer with whom they don't mix uh, socially. And also whom they say, well, I've got a tax lawyer from big city down the capital. And my, my lawyer is bigger than your lawyer, you know, those things. But uh, that was sort of the initial basis for my, uh, my practice. And then one of my partners had done some legal work for Acuff Rose Publications, which was the largest independent publishing house, music publishing house in the world. And uh, he did just local work for them. He didn't know anything about taxes and so forth. And uh, so when Wesley Rose and a few others met in uh, Miami at the uh, record manufacturer's convention and discovered that the treasurer of the Disc Jockey Association had taken the treasury and left uh, and was last seen going over the mountains heading west, I think. 
uh, they decided they wanted to form a country music association, trade association, because Elvis Presley was kicking their brains out. I mean, just the bottom line. They couldn't get airplay because it was all Presley. Country music. Couldn't yeah, get country airplay. music. So they came back, and with my tax background, why my partner volunteered me pro bono. He was bad about that. To uh, get get their uh, federal tax exemption status which I did, and in the process I got to know most people, and liked them, and got uh, more and more involved. We formed the Country Music Association. I was the lawyer for them and on the first board, and been on that board ever since. And uh, then we segued into uh, the Country Music Foundation, which formed the uh, Hall of Fame and Museum, the museum, which was, among other things, the repository for the physical Hall of Fame images that the uh, Country Music Association had elected. Uh, but <coughs> the people were real good people. Um, smart as hell, good business people. And uh, at the same time, getting to know them more and more why uh, they became my clients in whole or in part. And uh, you know, it's like an amoeba, it just keeps splitting and multiplying. And the first thing I knew, the great much the greater part of my my practice was in intellectual property and the music business, mainly the entertainment business. And in the course of that, I represented, I, I know well over half of the people who are now in the Hall of Fame. And they ran the gamut from Roy Acuff to Shania Twain. Now, I have a very paternalistic feeling toward uh, Shania, whose name really is Eileen. I'm the only one now that calls her Eileen, as she signs her letters to me. <laughs> but uh, a lady in Canada, a manager, called me. I'd done some little diddling thing for her. I don't even remember what it was, wasn't much. But, uh, in fact, I think I did it with a phone call, a threat or two. But uh, she wanted to know if she could fly Kitty and I up to Canada to listen to two artists that she represented and see if I would be willing to uh, to represent them. And we did. And. Uh, the first one was a very, very good piano bar entertainer. And she was never going to be anything more than a piano bar entertainer. Then we drove up about 50 miles north of Toronto to this resort, which had two lakes, three golf club, golf courses, um, a hot tub in every room, every suite. There weren't any room suites. And uh, she was the headliner for their uh, dinner room entertainer. I met her, she was a nice little girl, really very nice, sweet. Had her, she'd been orphaned and had raised her uh, younger siblings and had them there with her. 
They were, they were equally polite, which reflected well on him. But we went down to the second show to hear. She was headlining basically a Broadway type uh, show. And for those few lawyers who have had a drink or two at an evening dinner party, you will appreciate the clatter of china and silver that was in a large dining room with an entertaining entertainer's stage on the other end. The minute that Eileen stepped out on that stage, you could have heard a pin drop. She, personality-wise, uh, just projected her personality to the entire audience. I've heard Lena Horne did it, Sinatra did it, Half a dozen people at the most I have, have ever heard have, have really captured the, the audience by sheer personality. Jimmy Hoffa did it. No, I mean literally. He had a personality. You could feel the magnetic field around him. But um, anyway, I was very impressed and I told Mary, yes, I would be delighted to do anything I could to help her, bring her down. So I, I got a presentation tape done for, by Norris Wilson, who owed me some, and he is a very good producer, music man. And uh, then we were able and rarely have I had this pleasure. Instead of trying to find a contract for an artist, we sat down and decided which label, which company, we were going to let have her. She was that good. And we analyzed them, picked Mercury because of their international distribution and their local distribution if they had a big seller. That Saturday night dance thing, they loaded their system and did great. Anyway, we took her over and uh, played her for <clears throat> the executive producer who was head of Mercury here. And he banged his chest and said, I want her. Then Greed got him and he said, does she still have her publishing? And I said, you are a greedy son of a bitch. She is go going to have it or you don't get her. So that she had a very good relationship there. She sold 34, 35 million copies of her first album that uh, was more than any other act or female country act has ever ever sold and uh, she did very well and then uh, she <coughs> <clears throat> had a um, a child by uh, the husband she had acquired and thought that uh, looking after the child was more important than uh, the record business and she made enough money she could make that decision. So um, she had a place in Switzerland and she is been living there now, although just recently, within the last year, she has a or had a contract with uh, one of the major casino hotels in Vegas. 
for 60 performances over a period of, I think, four or five years, which paid her a uh, vulgar amount of money, plus a suite, one of the major suites on the hotel, whenever she was there. And uh, she had been drawing huge crowds out there, even though she hasn't had any uh, any product, new product out on the market sometime. But uh, it was fun being a part of the development of her of her career. That's the fun part. Some of the people in the business are not that nice. And on occasion, well, my yardstick for a, a client is they, what they wanted not only had to be legal, but had to be proper. And if a client wasn't proper, I wouldn't represent him. And happily, I was able to make that choice because if your client is proper, he really doesn't get into any bad trouble. So uh, there was one gospel writer, a very well-known one, who came in one day and wanted to do something. And I, I said, no. He said, well, it's legal. I said, it's legal, but it's not proper. And I won't have anything to do with it. I had his file on my desk because I, he had an appointment. I says, here, take your file. He said, you're firing me? I said, well, that's what it amounts to, yes. And it was funny. He has told it all over town about the time that I fired him. And um, he and I are great friends now. But uh, those are the things that uh, I have been retired now 15 years. And it is the relationship that I have had with interesting people during the 51 years of my active practice that has made it all worthwhile. Financially, I have been able to afford two children and I didn't tie up that string. I'm sorry. Horton and Mary Dell's mother, the lady that I married six months after um, I gave her my seat in the, bar, the officer's club bar. I lost her to cancer after 40 years of a wonderful, wonderful marriage. And sometime later, there had been another couple that we had been not close close friends but close acquaintances with. And the husband in that family had died about a year before Kitty did. And we were, I was invited to a New Year's Eve party that had been, been, been uh, attending for years and years. And they also invite, it's awkward for someone to go to a party single. So they checked with me and uh, invited uh, the widow of this other couple that we had, had known. And one thing led to another. And uh, Mentally, I was in pretty bad shape, but subsequently and eventually, um, we married each other, 
and we've looked after each other. And she has been very, very good to me because when I start feeling sorry for myself, she kicks me in the tail and keeps me moving. Tell, her, tell been, us who this is. Uh, her name is Sandra. She is, oddly enough, a Bohemian by race. Bohemia being that vast center of Middle Europe, uh, which is now became Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Poland. In fact, in the eighth century, the king of Bohemia was the Holy Roman Emperor. But a anyway, her, her family on both sides is um, from from that area, and um, most of them settled down in the rice fields of uh, Arkansas. Oh, gee, a couple of hundred years ago, and then during the Depression, some of them went up to Chicago to uh, look for work to try to get enough money to send back and keep keep the family farm. We were down there and her cousin has five or six thousand acres of land that he rotates between rice and uh, wheat and corn, and it's all under irrigation, very scientifically done. And she, he's, he's got, uh, he's got uh, machinery taller than this house, used to, and nice people. But anyway, that is my second and present wife. I have been twice blessed, and um, Kitty was with me in the difficult financial years. My only regret is that I could not have done more for her for a longer period, but uh, that is something that uh, I was denied. Um, Sandra, as I say, has looked after me very well, and we have a good marriage again. So other than that, I'm, uh, I look back over years of, um, of practice, and uh, my, I guess you would call my naval career, I stayed in the intelligence reserve long enough to uh, retire, which means the government pays for my medicine and so forth, which I'm grateful for. But um, it has, I have had a, a good life and I have no real regrets other than um, not always being able to do everything I wanted to wanted to do for the people that uh, I was closest to. And um, I see uh, I had always said that when the practicing law no longer was fun and close-knit profession. I was going to quit, and it isn't, and I, I quit 15 years ago. I attribute it somewhat to the growth of the multi-lawyer firms, particularly those who are <coughs> have uh, multi-state offices uh, whose lawyers number in the hundreds or in the thousands and whose uh, emphasis 
it's on billable hours and money and uh, getting and uh, milking clients and uh, it, it just wasn't fun. The uh, unfortunately financial considerations, which are normal, have increased and driven out the collegiality and the professionalism and ethics of much of the of the bowl, bowl much of the bar. It uh, people don't have time to sit down and have a cup of coffee or or have um, a drink in the afternoon because they need to put in more billable hours. I had one partner who shall remain unnamed who would come to the office at nine and leave at five and bill 12 billable hours. I think he billed double when he went to the bathroom. But um, that and the government injection uh, bureaucratic injection and regulation of the profession. Just, it has taken the professionalism out of it and the closeness that lawyers felt to each other. We, for many years, We didn't have any lawyers that we couldn't trust implicitly. And if you had a thing, you wanted to put down a consent motion or a consent order for a postponement or some such, the other lawyer might say, well, I'm getting ready to go to the courthouse. You want me to do it for both of us? And you would say yes and never think about it. Now, I would say that I, I could not say that about a great majority of the lawyers who are coming on. They're not taught that way anymore. And uh, Horton has done a wonderful job practicing law. And uh, he started up in, I think, an atmosphere of professionalism and ethics and uh, was able to, to maintain that because he doesn't have the pressure that a huge firm would, would uh, heap on him. I'm very proud of what he's doing. And it uh, beats it's a noble profession when it is practiced as a profession. If it is a trade, it is akin to the ladies on Dickerson Road. On that note. <laughs> on that note, I would say to the young lawyers coming on with all sincerity that the character and integrity of their conduct as attorneys and as individuals should be the keynote, the lodestar of their profession and of their personal life.